Good morning. Good morning, church. Welcome. Welcome to worship. I invite you to direct your attention forward as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship this morning. Amen. Thank you, Gail. <laughs> oh, there's a crowd. There's the crowd. Good morning. I'm uh, David Dobbs. I want to welcome each of to uh, First United Methodist Church here in Quitman on a cloudy, and it looks like potentially rainy Sunday. We could use that. Um, I have got a number of announcements, so if you'll bear with me, um, and then if there's anything that you might want me to add to this list of 12, please uh, share with me. You'll be 13. Um, first of all, uh, to our visitors and also to our members, the little red book right in front of you, if you'll fill that out and then be ready to put that in the collection plate, we'll get a record of your attendance. That would be fantastic. The trustees are not meeting today at 1.30, but I'm going to brag on the Gerald's I need you to stand. Come on, get up. Come on. Yep, 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 yep. And the reason I need you to stand is because your backs are hurting and I need you to stretch. Come on, come on, get up. Make, I'm going to embarrass you until you do. So if you will look at the grounds and all of the plant materials and the flower beds that have been cleaned, getting ready for more, that's them. So give them high fives, hugs, thank them. <laughs> And if you got an aspirin, they will take that too. Uh, the church office will be closed tomorrow in observance of our Labor Day holiday. Um, this uh, Tuesday, uh, 8 to 9.30 in Joy Hall, again, we will be honoring our military veterans and their spouses. Um, on Wednesday, got quite a bit going on. We're, um, we're going to start back with our meals. So here we go. Youth Meal 5, our service, I mean our meal for the adults We'll kick back off this week, um, Wednesday night, and then uh, Bible study at 6, so 5 o'clock meal, um, and we're going to be in chapter 5 of Matthew this week. Um, I did not get a chance to go on Wednesday night to hear chapter 4, but I know that he rocked the house, so if you got to go, um, come see me after church and tell me what I missed, because I heard it was fantastic. Um, there will uh, be no choir practice this Wednesday so again, no choir practice. Okay, um, it's time for a joke. So Cedar came up before. I've got more announcements, so hang with me. He came up and he said, what do you call a hunter that has no nose and no body? And the answer is nobody knows. <laughs> I thought it was cute. So um, number six on the announcement list is noted on the back of your bulletin, the rail offering during uh, Holy Communion benefits Operation Christmas Child. The offering is going to help with supplies, shoe boxes, um, will soon be available in the Narthex and Joy Hall for 
this important ministry as we prepare again to help those in need. Um, next week, next Sunday, the September the 8th, there will be a gathering somewhere. Um, if if uh, those that might be listening online, if you happen to come next Sunday to our 8.30 service, you can head to Joy Hall for everyone else. We'll start probably around 925, and it's just going to be a time of fellowship, coffee, good time. So again, Joy Hall next week. And I know we have somebody lined up to bring treats. The journey class is taking care of treats. You got it? All right, good deal. Eggs Benedict? What? I'm just... What do you want? Okay. Talk to, talk to them. Um, we're getting close. So the Wood County Child Protective and Welfare Board has scheduled their uh, annual Tips for Tots. Um, it's in Winsboro at Winsboro City Hall on Monday, September the 9th. Uh, dinner starts at 5.30. It's going to be catered by Seth's here in Quitman. And uh, the, the cost is $25 per person. Um, celebrity waiters representing uh, First Church are um, our Pastor Harper and Sam Scroggins. So we'll have to talk about what that entails, including attire in preparation for Monday week. Uh, be sure to sit, if you want to, at one of our tables and give them lots and lots of tips uh, ones are good, fives are better, tens are even better, you get the drip. Um, all the tips benefit the foster children of Wood County, and also there will be a silent auction and a raffle. So that was my 12. Does anybody have anything else they want me to add? Yes, ma'am. Feel free to grab a shoebox at the end of the service, and there's plenty in the narthex as well. All right, we already got them ready. Anything else? Okay, stand and see, greet your neighbor. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to direct us back towards our pews. Let us all remain standing as we sing our opening hymn, To God Be the Glory. <laughs>
remain standing and join us for the historic affirmation of faith known as the Apostles' Creed. I believe, I believe in, in God, God the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, church, is our time for community prayer. What's going on in your life? What's going on in the life of the church? What's going on in our world that we need to be reminded to pray for? Then pray with me. Our Father God, we begin our first fruits of this week. By coming together to worship your name, putting the first things first so that the second things are not diminished, but seen through the appropriate lens of life. God, as we come here this morning, I pray that we would lay down all the things we kept to ourselves just a moment ago. Things that we're anxious about, things that's coming up that we are uncertain of, things that we're excited about that we want to celebrate, uh, and things that we grieve about that we don't want to admit it, but still kind of hurts a little bit. All these things we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Screaming and running. <laughs> All right. So, I got my buddies. Um, I have a question for you. When you look at this beautiful creature from the movie, what do you see? 
What do you see? A pig, a piggy bank. I see bacon, but that's just me. Um, what about what about this one? T Rex. A dinosaur, right? Would you like to be friends with a dinosaur? Yeah. No. Yes. What about being friends with a pig? You, you would say yes, some would say no, right? Some would say they're dirty, some would say that they're bacon. Some would say they would eat them, but some of them would say they can't reach me with their little arms, so I'm, I'm safe. Here's the thing, though. You know what? When we have friends, there are some friends that are kind of like T-Rex from the movie. He's kind of scared all the time. He's very anxious, and he tries to be funny, and he tries to make everybody laugh. And then we have friends who become like a pig. He's kind of more serious. He's the one who you need to follow the rules and do things exactly what we're supposed to do, right? And sometimes we have friends that are just like the pig or just like T-Rex. And you know what? That's what makes us interesting is, you know, I might be the T-Rex. Jennifer would call me the T-Rex. Um, and the pig is just a neighbor. Okay, I don't know who he is. But here's the thing. We treat them the same. And so today we're going to, in Children's Church, if you go, we're going to talk about a, an account in the Bible where some friends went out of their way to help their friend, even though he was different than them. And so I like the movie because what happens is all of these characters come together to help each other accomplish the goal. And so we're going to kind of touch on that a little bit as we go to Children's Church. Would you pray with me real fast before we go? Dear God, Dear God thank, you thank you for our friends, even though they're different than us. May I be an example of you to them. In your name, amen. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, creators of Toy Story. <laughs> As the uh, children go back uh, to their families or off to Children's Church, just a moment of privilege when we uh, talk about why we pray together. When we pray together, it binds us together in a spiritual way. So as I was praying, I was not having my eyes closed, and I was looking at my daughters. Um, and my oldest daughter was hugging and kissing my younger daughter during the prayer. And if you know anything, anything about their dynamic, the youngest one always wants physical affection from the older daughter, who is a complete touch-me-not. Uh, <laughs> and so to see that display in that moment was very touching to me. And I think a great example of how um, it's a lot harder for us to be in conflict with one another while we are praying for one another. I once heard somebody say, I can't be mad at my spouse if I have been spending the morning in worship and prayer next to them. So I just thought that was sweet, and I wanted to share that with you. As we prepare for our time of offering, I want to remind you that giving is an act of worship. Um, and part of who we are is how we give of ourselves back uh, to the community, to the church, and to God. So let's continue to worship God through our tithes and our offerings.
please remain standing for our next hymn that I think the choir can help teach us a little bit. Uh, I want a principle within. It's page 410. We'll sing all verses.
I'm glad we've come, come, come together. Today's scripture reading is from Titus 3, 9. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thank you, David. Thank you, choir. And good morning, church. Today is part two of our sermon series, Religion and Politics, where last week we reminded ourselves that our ultimate authority is to God, that we should put our allegiance to Jesus over anything else, even government or political affiliation. But we also talked about the practical and spiritual reasons why God would call us to then be subject to the governing authorities in our life. As much as is possible, Christians should live peaceably with all. This morning we're going to talk about how we came to have a separation of church and state. And a little bit about how Christians can then navigate through the sometimes dicey waters of modern secularism. Let's pray. Father God, open us up. Open us up that we might receive a word from you today. Holy Spirit, I ask now that you would speak through me, or if need be, cast me aside and speak in spite of me, that we would know you. And as we come to know more about who you are, then, Lord, would we come to know more about our first and most important identity as your children, as your church, as your people. God, we pray for our country, our political leaders, and for our dinner tables during this set this November election time. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So last week I talked a lot about how you shouldn't align yourself with a movement or a political party or a politician that you think is on God's side. Because when my side becomes God's side, Then we start to blur the lines between the sacred and the secular. And when we do that, we can confuse one for the other. And when we do that, it's a lot more easier for then me to see my position as obviously right and your position is obviously wrong and evil. Because if Jesus Christ is our Lord, then we don't need to be forced into a political position or movement or group in the way that sometimes people say that we must be. This idea that if you're going to be on my team, you got to get with everything that we believe in. Or if, if, if you like something that that other side likes, well, then you might as well go over there because you're not welcome here with us anymore. So you can vote for a president based on your values, based on something that you like about them or don't like about the other one, without having to agree with every single thing that they say, do, or even stand for. God is not put into a box. Christians should not be forced into political boxes either. And here's the thing, you can be, you can consider yourself a conservative, you can consider yourself a liberal, you can love your country and be proud of your country. None of those are bad things, unless your ultimate authority isn't Jesus first. Because when we start to elevate secondary things to the level of God, That's when idolatry happens. And when we start to make our politics as our now main identity, it is in our politics that we go to find our value and self-worth. And now once we've done that, then yeah, we're forced to dig in. We're forced to argue vehemently against and demonize against the political opposition in order to maintain that misguided identity. We actually do this in all areas of our life. 
it's college football is back in town. This is, this is usually, uh, we do this with our sports teams all the time. We elevate our sports teams that we like to our identity, to one of our most important identities. Well, I'm a cowboy. I'm a longhorn. I'm an Aggie. This is where I go to find my self-worth and value. But the problem is, when my team loses, then it negatively affects all the rest of my life because I've been putting too much of my identity in the team that I like. Now, I think we can all agree that that's kind of silly, isn't it? You don't have any control over how good or bad your team is. It's silly when we do it with our sports teams, but when we do it with our politics, now the stakes have been raised a lot more. Because now we're not talking about how good or bad the Dallas Cowboys are going to be this year. Now we're talking about morality, justice, how we're supposed to live together in a society well. Friends, people who put their main identity in their politics, people who get their self-worth from their political affiliations are a lot easier to manipulate and to deceive and to control than people who find their ultimate authority in Christ. And that's why God says, don't get wrapped up in foolish controversies. Don't, 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 don't get in, in endless arguments that don't go anywhere. Don't bicker and quibble about the law that only seem to further divide you from other people. Because that is where the enemy likes to hang out. As Christians, we don't have to play that game. Because I can be wrong about something. Unless I'm putting my identity in that thing. Does that make sense? That if all that who I am is put into how my football team did on Saturday, then who am I when they lose? I can't be wrong about my politics if that's all that I am. And in a society that feeds off of our contempt for one another, that wants us to be angry and mad at each other, Christians shouldn't play that game. Because I think the enemy likes to use deception and division in our country in order to divide us. Because the issues that we are divided over today are not always black and white. There are people behind the issues and the things that we stand for. Now, they matter. They're a big deal. We're, they're, they're, I'm not saying it's not important, but Paul is saying don't bicker and argue endlessly over it. The more we get away from, well, what is God's actual heart on this issue? Who am I in allegiance really to? The more we get away from that and the more we move to just simple name calling and character issues and endless controversies that don't go anywhere. Arguments that are actually set up to divide, not to bring together. Paul says, don't be a part of that. Don't, don't play that game. Don't let them put you in a box. Stand firm in who you are in Christ. And this has been happening all throughout history. This is not a new thing. The simple fact that David just read that scripture from Paul suggests that even in the very beginning, Christians had to deal with social issues in their day. Things that we were divided on. Things that we would bicker and argue about and... Paul says, let's not be those people. Let us be different than the secular world out there. And throughout history, the Christian church has done that <laughs> with varying degrees of success or failure. In the fourth century, we thought that thy kingdom had actually come to earth. When Emperor Constantine made Christianity the official Roman religion. 
But here's the thing about a religion that goes from an underground, illegal Jewish sect that's persecuted to now the official religion of the most powerful empire of the world. Power has a way of changing things. Where there is power, politics and corruption soon follow. John Emmerich Acton, Lord Acton, while contemplating the Inquisition, famously wrote that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. He goes on to say that throughout our history, great men are almost always bad men. Now that is a very bleak outlook on humanity. But it is one that I am forced, uh, unfortunately, to mostly agree with. Yes, there is good people out there. But without the Holy Spirit guiding our hearts, without submission to Christ, humanity doesn't seem to handle power very well. And unfortunately, that is also true of the human institution of the church throughout our history. In fact, the reason why we now live in a country where you are free to believe whatever you want and why I am not allowed to stand up here and tell you who you should vote for in November is because we actually spent centuries figuring out that you can't force somebody to believe anything. And that a compelled national religion doesn't bring about the kingdom of God like we thought that it would. Sure, most of the world considers themselves Christians now, but guess what? We just found other things to argue about within Christian theology. Now we argue about, fight over, and yes, unfortunately, even kill one another over things like what's happening during communion, how, when, and if baptism is necessary. And when the church gets corrupt enough, God is there again, sending the Holy Spirit through someone like Martin Luther in his 95 thesis to reform the church again. Just like God did over and over again in the Old Testament with his prophets through the chosen people. But following the Reformation, then we just spent centuries having the Catholics and the Protestants trying to wipe each other off the planet all in the name of Orthodox belief. Like there was a time in our world where everybody basically, for the most part, was Christian. It wasn't the kingdom of God that we thought it would be. It became yet another us versus them. Until finally, <laughs> Western Enlightenment said, enough of this. And John Locke, in his letters of toleration, wrote that people should be allowed to believe what they want. And those are the principles upon which this country was established. And that's worked out for us pretty well so far. I mean, at least from a government level, we're not killing each other over our beliefs anymore. But the other side of that coin is that freedom of religion means that as time goes on, you're going to exist in a more and more pluralistic society. A more and more secularized society. Where the culture actually influences what the church should look like rather than the other way around. That's a misplaced picture. That should have come a little bit earlier. It's fine. I just want to, I didn't want people to think that, that that picture went with that sentence. I like the Constitution, is basically what I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not anti-Constitution. Appreciate, appreciate y'all's work back there, guys. Thank you. And, and personally, I think freedom of religion was the right way to go. Like, there's a reason why separation in church of a state, separation of church and state came to be, because we were just killing each other. But the other side of that coin is now we are more and more divided. 
Now we are more and more secularized. Now we're living more and more in a culture where society wants to hear what we as Christians have to say less and less. So how do we, as Christians whose authority is to God first, but are also subject to the governing authorities, how do we navigate through this society? Well, we've already talked about one part, and I think it's probably the most important. Make sure that your main identity is first and foremost to Christ. That your allegiance and your self-worth and your value is found in God, and that will protect you from playing the games of the world. Whose, whose party are you for? Whose team do you worship? And second, walk humbly before the Lord. Ask God to give you a heart of humility when interacting with people who think or act or vote differently than you do. A heart of humility says, what if I'm wrong about this? Because here's the thing, if Christ is my king, then it's okay if I'm wrong about this. Politics are not my God. My college football team is not my God. The president of the United States, as it turns out, is not my God. God is my God. And so if I'm wrong, it's not the end of the world. If I find out that I'm wrong. Humility is asking yourself, what are the strengths of the position of the person that thinks differently than I do? Rather than just focusing on and highlighting all of their weaknesses. Because it's not as if getting to know the other side is going to turn you into that side. I think a lot of times if we, we feel like if we don't villainize the opposition, then they might make some sense to us. And that makes us uncomfortable. That's not really the case, though. How many times do you build up a caricature of somebody in your mind about a person or a group of people, and then when you sit down and get to know them, you think, wow, they aren't anything like I have been brought up or thought of to believe. Because when you rest in the truth of the Lord, you realize that you don't have to be afraid of other positions. If truth is truth, then it can stand up to other positions and scrutiny. So you will probably find that getting to know your neighbor who has the different political sign in their yard is not going to change the fact that you disagree with things about your neighbor. But it will put you in a better position to have that word that I keep talking about, compassion for your neighbor. It seemed like every time Jesus did something in the New Testament, did a miracle, healed someone, it was preceded by and he was moved with compassion. Compassion to tip somebody that may or may not deserve it. Compassion to look at somebody as more than just their voting ticket. Compassion to see the person behind the divisive issue. And then you're in a position to respectfully disagree with them. To say, I understand what you're saying. I can actually tell where you're coming from on this. And, and, and some of it actually makes a little sense to me, but I, I respectfully disagree. And then move on with your life, friends. Get back to being <laughs> the light bearer of Christ that God is calling you to be. Last presidential election, my father-in-law sends me a text message I think, I guess because I'm a pastor, he likes to ask me philosophical questions from time to time. And he said, Thomas, which is more powerful today, truth or perception? I thought that's an interesting question. 
Because from the pulpit, the right answer is truth, right? The Sunday school answer is truth wins out. But, man, in our world today, it, it, it is tempting to see that perception and opinions are ruling the day. Politics seems to thrive off of half-truths and perceptions. But make no mistake, truth will win out in the end. There is no distortion or falseness or darkness or division from the enemy that will last. Those things have a shelf life. They have an expiration date in God's kingdom. Because the light of God is shining and piercing through the darkness. My friends, as Christians, we are to be bearers of that great light. So by all means, have political opinions. Get involved in the society and in the government that God has placed you in. Share what you believe about politics to others. Just not from the pulpit. But do so in a way that doesn't shatter who you are if it turns out that you're wrong. Or that the person who you voted for didn't win the election. Because that is not where our ultimate authority lies anyways. If Christ is my king, then it's okay if I lost. It's okay if the Dallas Cowboys didn't win the Super Bowl. It's okay if who I wanted to be president is not president. It still matters. Policy matters. But it's okay. Because my God and my kingdom rest somewhere else. Walk humbly before the Lord and show a divisive world how to do that. Next week, we are going to wrap up this series by talking about not who you should vote for, but how. And how when it becomes really personal, as in me and my spouse don't agree on who the next president should be. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, I do pray that you would give us a heart of humility, that you would help us to remember the first things first, because sometimes the secondary things seem really important, and we know that they are. But what great devastation occurs when we elevate secular things to the sacred level. So help us to have a heart for you. Help us to seek out your heart on the issues that divide us, rather than demonizing the opposition. So that we can bring honor and glory to you. In your name we pray. Amen. First Sunday of every month, we partake in communion together. And if you are new, uh, communion here in the Methodist Church is what we, we have an open table, which means you don't need to be a member of the Methodist Church, a member of this church, or what I like to say, which also gets me in trouble sometimes, is you don't even have to be a really good Christian right now. Like, yeah, don't, don't worry about you earning the right to come up here. Um, Jesus says, no, if you want to come, come. Receive my grace. In fact, even if you don't even know what that means, but there's something inside you that beckons you, come. Come. Receive my grace this morning. Be made new in Christ. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and each other. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. Now that proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven.
In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to our God, Almighty King and Savior. You breathed into us the breath of life, established the church in Christ's headship, and reminds us of where our true authority lies, so that we may be, we may be freed of sweeping group politics that d demand our allegiance to all things that really only God deserves. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna. Next. Is that? Okay, sorry. My mind is elsewhere. On the night at which Christ gave us, gave up for us, Christ took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, Christ took the cup, gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which has been poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins and the redemption of this world. Do it as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in union to this divided world, that we may heal in you. Until that day when Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly table with all of the saints throughout history. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Would those who are helping to serve uh, come forward? Christ's table has been prepared. He invites you to come.
So after my uh, preview for our closing sermon next week, my wife leans over to me and says, now everybody's going to think that we don't want to vote for the same president. <laughs> Rest assured that we are perfectly politically aligned. Now, y'all know what being around the, the Thanksgiving tables and the extended family tables is like, so we're going to address that next Sunday. Uh, but in the meantime, if you're a visitor among us, welcome. I'd love to meet you in the back. Uh, if you, I'd love to get to know you. If uh, you're, you're really struggling with the whole politics thing right now, it is the season, right? Uh, I'd love to pray with you or talk to you some more about that. Or if there's something that the pastor said that you absolutely disagree with, uh, talk to Daryl. Uh, he, he's... <laughs> I've never walked away from Daryl without a smile on my face, so uh, he's, he's the person I would send all comments of negativity towards. Uh, uh, but in the meantime, I invite you to stand with our closing hymn, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his light of his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and always. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all of God's people, set it together. Amen. Amen.